her childhood in that city, the way that she was brought up. In 2008, another problem started for Rifqa that not does this uh, not sideline the memories of Haifa, but added another layer to her story. She was forced to contend with an additional displacement, the impending displacement of 28 families from Sheikh Jarrah. They were all refugee families, just like Rifqa's family. And they, were, they would have to deal with the settler incursion onto their neighborhood, the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Rifqa then was forced to deal with a new displacement, just like while she was to deal with the displacement from Haifa in 1948. Rifqa's skin, lacerated with the hope of return, burned with the itches of her memories in Haifa, and her body beaten by settlers and carrying the memories of return and the hope to continue fighting for her new family, for her extending family to stay in Sheikh Jarrah, carries the entire burden of the Palestinian people. Rifqa's history, as well as the stories of the families of Jarrah, are not just a testament to their private stories, but also a testament to the collective story of the Palestinian people, a people moving from one displacement into another, proving that the Nakba was not just a one-sided event or a single event that began and ended in 1948, rather, that the Nakba is an ongoing process in which Palestinians from all sides of this uh, country are forced to contend with Israel's continued incursion into their lives, as well as the struggles of millions of refugees to return home. With us in this panel then are four uh, distinguished speakers who will tell us about these stories of Palestinians in Jerusalem. First, we will hear from Asil al Bajje, a legal researcher at Al Haq, about the context in which Israel is carrying out these, this process of eviction in Sheikh Jarrah in particular and in Jerusalem in general. Then we will hear from Mohammed Al Kord. Uh, then we will hear from Mohammed Al Kord, who will talk about the problems that he had to live through in, in Sheikh Jarrah, how he grew up in, with his family, especially since 2009, how he was forced to share his own home with the settlers who invaded under, under the protection of Israeli court his home. Then we will hear from Mr. Zakaria Oudi from the Civic, the Civic Coalition. Zakaria will tell us about the broader policy that Israel is implementing in Sheikh, in Sheikh Jarrah in particular and in Jerusalem in general, not just the policies of eviction, but also the policies of displacement, the policies of residency revocation, home demolition. All of these policies create continuous layers of oppression and disposition. And finally, we will hear from Professor Michael Link, the rapporteur for, for the United Nations for the situation in the Palestinian territories occupied in 19. Professor Link will talk about the, the perspective of international law and the position of international law uh, and, and what Israel is doing according with international law and how Israeli policies are violating it, international law. So we'll start with Ms. al -Bashi. The floor is yours. Thank you, Boudour. Um, I would like to start where you, in one point that you highlighted, which is also the, the title of our webinar today, the ongoing Nakba, to talk about that the Nakba of 1948, when the mass displacement and dispossession of Palestinian happened, is not a historical event, but rather the Zionist settler colonial project since a century, it's, it's premised on the logic of controlling the land, whole land of historic Palestine, and uh, displacing the Palestinian uh, population in it. And the story of Sheikh Zarrah is just one example of how the Zionist project aims at controlling the Palestinian land and displacing the Palestinian people. But we also have the policies of concentrating Palestinians as well. This is evident in the Gaza Strip, for example, in, in the, the areas uh, B, A, B, and C, so-called area A, B, and C, uh, as per the Oslo Accords in the West Bank and also inside the Green Line. But since we're talking about Jerusalem today, I would like to highlight that Jerusalem is not, an, is not inclusive and that these forcible transfer policies, they happen on both sides of the Green Line. But Jerusalem is indeed a place where these policies are systematic and they are intensified. And the, the case of Sheikh Jarrah is just one example. 
Uh, and now the Israeli authorities are very cl clear in the, in the intention to transform the, the demographic composition of the city of Jerusalem to ensure Israeli Jewish domination and to have the systematic erasure of the Palestinian people. My colleagues, as uh, Boudour mentioned, my colleague Zakaria will, will highlight the various policies that are uh, there in East Jerusalem that aim at transforming the, the demographic composition of, of, uh, of uh, the city in favor of Israeli uh, domination, such as uh, the widespread house demolition, the policy of residency relocation, the uh, crippling of the economy, settler tourism, forced eviction, and so on and so forth. But all these policies, when we take them together, they contribute towards creating a, um, an environment whereby Palestinians are dry, uh, forced to leave the city, which we uh, refer to as the coercive environment, leading to indirect forcible transfer. And moving on to the specifics of forced evictions in Sheikh Zarrah, I would like to shed light on the fact that the 500 people residing in Sheikh Zarrah, uh, specifically in Karmel Jauni area, are refugees uh, since 1948, when the Zionist settler colonial forces forcibly displaced the 80% the of the Palestinian population. And in the immediate aftermath of the establishment of the State of Israel, what it did is that it designed a series of discriminatory laws whereby they, they, they formed the foundation of its apartheid regime. One such law that is very uh, relevant to the case of Sheikh, Sheikh Zarrah is the so-called uh, absentee property law of 1950. And I'm quoting absentee here because uh, what Israel claims is that these Palestinian refugees and IDPs internally displaced are absent, but the, in fact, they, they, the Israeli authorities deny their right to return to their homes. And this absentee property law uh, assigns the properties and lands and, and homes of the Palestinian refugees and IDPs uh, for confiscation by the Israeli state. Um, and so in the case of Sheikh Jarrah, for example, we see that the 500 people now residing in East Jerusalem, they have their original homes just a few kilometers in West Jerusalem or in Yaffa or in Haifa, but they are denied the right to return to these homes and to reclaim these properties. And Israel, in order to ensure the maintenance of its apartheid regime, it also create, uh, ensure, it, it, it creates uh, the policy of st strategic fragmentation of the Palestinian people, whereby, for example, it denies the refugees to return to their homes, but also the coercive environment I talked about before, which drives the ongoing transfer of the Palestinian population on both sides of the Green Line. And in East Jerusalem, East Jerusalem specifically, when Israel occupies East Jerusalem in 1967 and illegally annexes uh, East Jerusalem, it extends its, its uh, civil legal system to the occupied territory. And not only it does that, but it in, uh, like continues to pump and enact more discriminatory laws and policies to ensure that they, they, it, it arrives at is like it's the, the demographic uh, alternation of the demographic composition of the city. And one another law that is also relevant to the case of Sheikh Jarrah is a 1970 law is called the Legal and Administrative Matters Law. Basically, this law uh, allows exclusively uh, for Israeli Jews to pursue claims to land and property, which they allege to have been owned by Jews before the establishment of the State of Israel in East Jerusalem. And utilizing this discriminatory law, in the case of Sheikh Jarrah, we have two Jewish entities in 1972, after the, the enactment of the law in two years. What they did is that these Jewish, uh, Jewish entities, they claimed that they have the right to the uh, Sheikh Jarrah land, uh, Karmel Jauni area in specific, and they uh, secured the land ownership under this uh, discriminatory law. And, and in the 90s, this, uh, these Jewish entities, they sold their right, the, their ownership rights, they secured to a settler organization. And since this settler organization have uh, managed to, to got the rights of the, the land ownership of the Karmel Jauni area in Sheikh Jarrah, they have been evicting fi uh, lawsuit, uh, eviction lawsuits against the 500 residents of Sheikh Jarrah. Um, and here I would like to uh, quote uh, Professor John Doggart, who when wrote about, uh, commented on the apartheid system in South Africa, he said, 
that racial injustice was perpetrated in accordance with legal rules and political repression was administrated according uh, to carefully defined legal procedure. And evidently in, in Sheikh Jarrah, we see how these two laws, the 1950 law, which dispossessed Palestinian refugees properties, and also the 1970 law, which allows exclusively uh, the, the for Israeli Jews to reclaim uh, properties uh, they alleged to have owned in East Jerusalem. And these law work together to enforce the apartheid regime of, of Israel. But also I would like to shed light on the fact that it's not only the laws, but we have the collusion of between the Israeli governmental institutions. The, the judiciary plays a very, um, in the case of Sheikh Jarrah, the Israeli judiciary system also has been playing a discriminatory law, uh, role, sorry, in, in uh, uh, to ensure the, the displacement of the Palestinian people. Now, in Sheikh Jarrah, since 1972, the people of Sheikh Jarrah have been enduring a, an exhausting and a lengthy and unaffordable uh, uh, struggle within the Israeli courts. Uh, and not only are they under the threat of losing their home, but they're also asked to pay the, uh, the expenses of the settler organization, the expenses of their own eviction for the second time, and also, they are sometimes subjected to uh, violence, to intimidation, and to threats by these settler organizations. And as such, all these factors have rendered Palestinians in East Jerusalem, including in Sheikh Jarrah, under enormous psychological and financial uh, pressure as well. And I would like to end my intervention here by saying that the, the story of Sheikh Jarrah is also very similarly happening in, in another neighborhood in East Jerusalem, Batn al Hawa, specifically in Silwan, whereby 400 Palestinians as well are facing the same uh, fate of dispossession and displacement under the same uh, discriminatory law of 1970. Uh, in 2001, a settler organization managed to secure land ownership in Batn al Hawa area, and they have been filing eviction lawsuits against the 400. Um, residents of Batn al Hawa. And amidst this global pandemic, seven fam families of uh, 108 people in Batn al Hawa are uh, at imminent risk of forced eviction after Israeli courts ruled in favor of their eviction, uh, in favor of the settler organization. And um, oh, I think Mohammed will highlight more about the case of Sheikh Jarrah and uh, the fact that there are uh, four families now uh, of 30, uh, constituting 30 Palestinians facing the threat of Im uh, the imminent risk, uh, risk of uh, forced eviction. They were asked to leave their home by an Israeli court by 2nd of May. And um, while this is a very um, harsh story uh, that tells, uh, that portrays the ongoing Nakba the Palestinian are enduring, it also highlights the fact that the Palestinian people continue to, to resist and to, to be um, resilient against this uh, settler colonial and apartheid regime. And I will leave it to Mohammed to, to share his firsthand experience on this. Thank you. Mohammed is with us. Yes, hi, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself earlier. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Badur, and thank you so much, Asil. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and it's gonna be hard to follow that, but thank you so much, Asil. Um, to kind of start where you where you ended off, um, like you said, four families, or if we're being um, more general, seven families are facing um, the imminent threat of eviction or facing real eviction displacement orders, um, including my own. Um, the four, for the first four families are gonna be dispossessed on May 2nd and um, another three will be dispossessed on, on August 1st. But the story doesn't end or start with these evictions and certainly the torture that the Sheikh Jarrah people and people in Jerusalem um, in general that ha that people in Jerusalem and in Sheikh Jarrah have endured does not start or end with the eviction. For Sheikh Jarrah in particular, our families have been in a long tumultuous political battle with settler organizations working in collusion with the Israeli authorities since 1972. 
Um, and as Asil mentioned, that has been a long, psychologically draining and unaffordable um, thing to live through. And it certainly has shaped my own upbringing. Um, so much of my life has been re has revolved around. Excuse me, I just woke up. So much of my uh, life has revolved around going and coming and returning to Israeli courts, um, understanding what is, the Israeli judge has said. Um, also, we didn't speak Hebrew and everything was in Hebrew. Um, we didn't have enough money some, to afford it. So a lot of our money was wasted on these Israeli courts. And as Asil also mentioned earlier, now we're expected to pay the fees, the Israeli settlers fees for them um, to pay for our own dispossession really. Um, but that was not that was not uncommon. I didn't realize that was uncommon until I grew up, until I traveled. Because growing up in, in Jerusalem, certainly in the Eastern parts of Jerusalem and getting handed a legalized order of ethnic cleansing was a normal thing. Um, and this is because we were dealing with the judicial system that was not only turning a blind eye to these seller organizations, but in fact, working with them, paving the way for them. Um, making the process as convenient for them as possible. And in turn, these seller organizations act with the arrogance of someone that has impunity and they in, do in fact have immunity. Um, I'll speak from my own experience. As a child, I witnessed them um, act with that complete arrogance because what, it, what, what goes on in these in these um, events of displacement is not only the loss of property. It's not just the seller organizations taking over somebody, some family's home and then um, switching, uh, switching them for another settler family. No, what's going on is we have these seller organizations that are paying young settler men in their late 20s, early 20s, to live in our houses, to wield rifles, to make our neighbors' lives a living hell in order to intimidate our, our neighbors into leaving. So again, the story does not begin or end with the loss of property. It's so much more than that. It's about the harassment. It's about the psychological torture. It's about the um, financial draining. It's about making and cutting all community ties possible in Sheikh Jarrah. So what was once a neighborhood where children could play in the street, where community could gather under the tree and drink tea together, is now a highly surveilled, highly militarized zone um, where people do not even feel comfortable to sit and be in the street because of the intimidation, because of the settlers wielding rifles, and because of all of that. And as Budur began um, the introductions, Speaking about my grandmother, certainly my grandmother Rifka, who passed away in June last June, is 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 one of the people who who also lived this very first hand experience, and she was one of the people who confronted the settlers at any chance she was given. But she was also a person who who this was not her first rodeo. It was it was the third time um, she was thrown out from her home. For the first being in the 1948 Nakba. When, thousands, when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forcibly displaced, violently forcibly displaced from their homes. And then in 1967 and, and so on. And in 2009, um, it was her third time getting thrown out of her home. And had she been alive today, it would have been her fourth or fifth time. Same thing for my father. So what we're, what we're learning in what we're learning today in Jerusalem is that, and what we've always known, Yani, you know, is that the Nakba is continuous, it hasn't ended, it's not something to commemorate, it's not something to memorialize, it's not something to mourn, it's something that we are living um, under the, th the threat of daily, and not only is it continuous, but it's something that happens to us more than once, and it's, it, it, you have potential to be dispossessed, you have, there's potential for you to be displaced and ethnically cleansed more than once in your lifetime, and you see your neighbors um, so this, this scenario of ethnic cleansing is, is certainly one that is eminent in Jerusalem. And it's not something that is hidden, Yani. Um, the Israeli authorities boast about this. Israeli politicians boast about this. They use us and they use the, um, this war of demographics, this um, settler expansion into East Jerusalem in their electoral campaigns. This is a talking point. This is not um, a bug in the Zionist system. This is in fact a feature of the Zionist system. This is 
um, something that Zionists have um, endorsed and worked on. And we have many, many stories with um, confrontations with Israeli politicians, be it the mayor of Jerusalem coming to our house in 2009 and saying he wants to have his office there, or uh, former um, former tourism minister Benny Ayalon offering the residents of the neighborhoods, you know, myriad of money to give up our homes and obviously we refuse that but there there has been um an arrogance in the way they've acquired our homes and the way they have acquired um in uh, the way they have really stolen our homes and because this is an uphill battle and because this is something that we because this is an uphill battle and because this is something that um we know that is a losing game because you're going up against a a, a, a a judicial, a, a judicial system that is built by and for Israeli settlers to displace you. A, a judicial system that is actually in fact in place to displace you, to act upon your own ethnic cleansing. Um, you don't have many options, but you do go to the courts because you think that it's gonna elongate the process and it's gonna keep you in your house longer. But the, elong the elongating of this process makes this ethnic cleansing happen in droplets and it makes it happen in, um, in, in a way that seems like it's isolated cases, that it's more of a legal battle rather than a political one. This elongate, elongating of the legal process also happens under the expense of your own mental health. It happens under the expense of your own pockets. So it becomes this draining, draining um, thing, which drives me to, the, to my last point. In the last months, we have, particularly the young people in the neighborhood, have really recognized the importance and the need for a social media campaign, not really just a social media campaign, but a popular campaign, a campaign that centers people. Um, because for so long in Sheikh Jarrah, we have heard many promises, we have heard many condemnations, we have heard many people um, kind of clutch their pearls at, what ha at, at what's happening, but not really act. And so we decided, uh, and understanding that there's scant legal recourse for Palestinians, um, we decided to launch a media campaign under the name of Sif Sheikh Jarrah, and we have worked with many wonderful Palestinian um, journalists and organizations like Al Haq and many others um, to center Sheikh Jarrah and to also contextualize Sheikh Jarrah as not an isolated incident that is tragic but unique, but rather an incident that highlights a pattern in the Israeli authorities' um, game plan for Jerusalem, in the Israeli authorities' overall. Um, urban plan for Jerusalem that renders Palestinians a minority and effectively empties them out of their native city. Um, so this is where we are today. Um, we have a few weeks, we have a few weeks separating us from the first batch of um, forced evictions. And some days I wake up really depressed and nervous and think there's no, nothing we could do. And some days I feel um, a little bit more hopeful. I just woke up 20 minutes ago. So um, today I'm feeling hopeful. Inshallah, we'll, inshallah will yield results. I'm, I'm certain that political and diplomatic pressure and actual pressure, not just condemnations, not just, um, you know, not just like, but actual, actual pressure sanctions even, actual, actual consequences will yield results. So I am urging whoever is listening to us to push for that, and not just for the case of Sheikh Jarrah, but for everybody across historic Palestine who's facing any form of forced displacement, be it, be it home demolitions, be it exile, be it revoking of residency, be it uh, forced evictions. There's a, a myriad of ways that Israel is displacing us, and it needs to be held accountable because our Nakba is now. And with that, I'm going to um, finish. So thank you so much for listening to me. I appreciate you. Um, now it's the, the career, the floor is yours now. You can speak about these myriad policies that Mohammed talked about in addition to uh, evictions and forced eviction and displacement. So the floor is yours, Zakaria. Uh, thank you, Bidur. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in fact, uh, it's important to mention that Sheikh Jarrah case has been one of the longest a legal and political battle between 
the neighborhood the families and the settler movement from the other side the israeli institution including the legal system we are talking about 70 households nearly 550 people who are under the risk of displaced force displacement uh, 12 families were already displaced in 2008 and 2009. Uh, at the moment, as it was said, 19 households, nearly 78 people are under imminent risk of eviction or displacement at any time. So Sheikh Jarrah, it's not just a random selection of Sheikh Jarrah by the settler movement and the Israeli institutions. Sheikh Jarrah is part of the strategy, is part of the strategic plan for what they call it the Holy Basin, the Holy Basin, which include the old city and the surrounding area from the south, Silwan, from the east, Mount of Olive, and from the north is, is Sheikh Jarrah. So this is one of the area that has been the focus of the Israeli settler movement, of the Israeli institution. Sheikh Jarrah, it's important to mention that there is a plan, or there part of the plan is, there is a plan to build a settlement to replace the family of Sheikh Jarrah. Now it is in the municipality to build 220 settlement uh, unit. So Sheikh Jarrah is not an isolated area, uh, example for, it's, it's just one example for the policy of forcible transfer, for the policy of ethnic cleansing. It has been going on not only for 53 years, but for more than 73 years since uh, an Nakba. So uh, we have been really, I mean, there are other examples as, as mentioned, uh, Silwan has been the target, is not is uh, Batn al Hawa, is not only Batn al Hawa, Al Bustan is one of the neighborhoods in Silwan that now there are uh, 119 families that are facing home demolition. 23 families are facing home demolition by the beginning of May. So the, these are all different example of this Israeli policy. So during the last, it's important to mention that during the last 2020, we have witnessed an incredible increase of the Israeli colonization and policy, the Israeli urban discriminatory urban planning policies, which was encouraged by the previous uh, Trump American administration you know, by through their declaration that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Israel and moving the American embassy to East, Jer to East Jerusalem. So we have witnessed in spite of the COVID-19 during the 2020, we have witnessed an increase, a dramatic increase in settlement expansion. 345 settlement unit has been approved and put for implementation during the last year. And we, we are talking about the Israeli strategy, settlement strategy, where what they are trying to do, they are trying to surround the city of Jerusalem by settlement from the south, from the east, and from the north to, sub to separate Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank. So there have been several settlement projects approved from the South uh, Hamatos settlement uh, from uh, and Abogun expansion of Abu Ghanim from the East E1, the plan to start building E1, which is the considered the Eastern gate of Jerusalem, which if when it will be built, it will create a corridor in the in the middle, which will separate the south of West Bank from the north of the West Bank. Uh, as well, there the plan is to start building a road settlement in the north on the land of what used to be the, the airport of uh, Jerusalem. We are talking about 9,000 settlement unit. So all of these plans of settlement, which is part of connected to the Israeli discriminatory urban planning settlements, which aiming as well to control and to promote the Israeli expansion and the integration settlement of Jerusalem, as well the construction of the light tram. You know, there has been a construction for the light tram, the, uh, the 
cable car project which connect West Jerusalem with East Jerusalem to facilitate the movement of the city of the of the settlers and uh, to the city of Jerusalem. We have several plans for Jerusalem. We have what's so called the East Jerusalem city center. We have the plan of Wadi Joes, what we call it, the Wadi Silicon uh, plan to build a high tech compound which will destroy 200 businesses in the area. So uh, there are all these plans that, as I said, they are trying to surround the city of Jerusalem and to expand the settlements within the city of East Jerusalem through fragmentation and separation the neighborhoods from each other. So it's not only settlement that has been really increasing dramatically during the last year, but as well home demolition. And it's important to mention through uh, during the first quarter of this year, since January, uh, nearly 38 structure has been demolished in East Jerusalem. And during 2020, nearly 170 structures, including 102 residential homes or houses that has been destroyed, displacing 391 persons. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's not only the home demolition policy, as well as the Israeli residency policy, which as well include uh, revoking residency, restriction of family unification, close, uh, even freezing the family unification process, which has been taking place since 2002. So uh, all these policies and all these practices that has been going on, which is part of the part of the policies, really, which we, and we call it the colonial settler apartheid policies that aiming to promote and to keep the annexation of the city of Jerusalem. And it's part of the demographic battle that always by, uh, part of the Israeli strategies that to maintain a Jewish majority vis-a-vis -a, -vis a small Arab uh, minority and to change the correct Arab character of the, of the city of Jerusalem. So just to finish, Yani we call uh, upon the international community and especially I'm, I am calling upon Mr. Link. I know he has been working hard and he has been really trying uh, to do some work about what's going on in Jerusalem that we call international community to take a serious action. I think statements report is not good enough to stop what's going on. You know, this colonial settler apartheid regime will not stop as long as there is no serious action by the international community. I think always we talk about, yeah, especially the European state, the European Union, they keep talking about a two-state solution with East Jerusalem, the capital, but in fact, on the ground, nothing left from East Jerusalem. So at least Europe, European state, should defend what they try to call for, to defend what they call it a two-state solution, a Palestinian state uh, with Jerusalem, uh, its uh, capital. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zakaria, for your excellent introduction and basically summing up in such a short period of time, what Palestinians in Jerusalem have been forced to face. Now, I'll, uh, of course, Zakaria is the director of the civil coalition, uh, the civic coalition, sorry. Now I will hand the mic to Professor Michael Link, the special rapporteur for the situation of the Palestinian territories occupied since 1967, who will talk about what international se law says about Israeli policies in occupied and annexed Jerusalem. Professor Link, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this. And it's an honor to be asked to speak on this important webinar on forced evictions. And I'm thankful to the organizers for extending the invitation to me. I've been closely following the situation in occupied East Jerusalem for some time, and particularly the patterns of forced evictions and population transfers in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah. In early January, I released a statement as Special Rapporteur calling upon the Israeli government to reverse the eviction orders that are forcing Palestinian families from their homes in these neighborhoods. In my January statement, I said, the eviction orders are not random, 
but rather appear to be strategically focused on an area in East Jerusalem known as the Holy Basin. They seem to be aimed at clearing the way for the establishment of more illegal Israeli settlements in the area and physically separating and fragmenting East Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank. And earlier today, I've released another statement with, along with several other special rapporteurs that is primarily focused on settler violence in the OPT, but I do include this paragraph and let me quote it to you. Similarly worrying are reports that over 70 families living in the Khraim al Jabuni area of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem are under the threat of forced eviction to make place for new settlements. Seven households have already received eviction orders and asked to vacate their homes by the 2nd of May, 2021. Such forced evictions leading to population transfers are strictly prohibited under international law, the experts said. I have been asked by the organizers to address the issues of the forced evictions and transfers in the context of international law. I'm happy to do so, knowing that I'm likely speaking to a largely non-legal audience, so I will tailor my remarks accordingly. Respecting what is going on in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, there are three things above all that are important to mention with regards to international law. First, we are talking about an occupied territory, East Jerusalem, that has been illegally annexed by Israel. Annexation of occupied territory by the occupying power is absolutely forbidden in international law. There are no exceptions. This prohibition against annexation is a cornerstone of the Charter of the United Nations in 1945. And in November 1967, the UN Security Council, with specific reference to Israel following the June War and its cabinet vote to annex East Jerusalem, laid out the inadmissibility of annexation principle. In Resolution 242, the Security Council emphasized, quote, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. The Security Council has reaffirmed the inadmissibility principle on seven subsequent occasions. It also stated in Resolution 478 in August 1980 that all legislative and administrative attempts to alter the status and character of the holy city of Jerusalem are, and I'm quoting, null and void and must be uh, immediately rescinded forthwith. Of course, that has not happened. And Israel, in defiance of world opinion and international law, has continued to entrench its illegal annexation with little accountability from those countries who could impose a meaningful cost. Most recently, in 1998, the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court, uh, adopted new provisions regarding the crime of aggression. In the definition of, a, of aggression, the Rome Statute now includes annexation of territory by the use of force. This may become a subject of investigation by the ICC. <clears throat> My second point on international law is that East Jerusalem continues to be occupied in the eyes of the international community and Israel is duty bound to strictly and faithfully follow the requirements of international humanitarian law as set out in the 1907 Hague Regulations and the 1949 Geneva Convention. So with particular reference to the forced evictions that are ongoing in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, let me point to Article 43 of the Hague Regulations, which requires the occupying power while administrating the uh, occupied territory to, and I quote, take all measures in his power to restore and ensure as far as possible public order and safety while respecting, unless absolutely prevented, the laws in force in the country. The regulations also forbid the occupying power from confiscating private immovable property unless absolutely required for military needs or operations. These stipulations in the Hague regulations have been violated by Israel and East Jerusalem in multiple ways, most specifically by the enactment and enforcement of deeply discriminatory laws that privilege Israeli Jews over Palestinians with regards to property and housing rights. One of the clearest examples is the 1970 Legal and Administrative Matters Law enacted by the Israeli Knesset, which allows Israelis to, purchase, to pursue claims <clears throat> to land and property purportedly owned by Jews in East Jerusalem prior to 1948, while denying the right of Palestinian refugees the right to reclaim their lands and property within the 1948 borders of Israel. This 1970 law is at the heart 
of the current patterns of evictions and displacements of Palestinian families in East Jerusalem by settler organizations and the Israeli government. Let me also point to Article 49, Paragraph 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which absolutely prohibits the transfer by the occupying power of parts of a civilian population into the occupied territory. The Rome Statute has elevated the seriousness of this prohibition to a war crime. There are presently 12 Israeli settlements and more than 220,000 settlers in East Jerusalem. We can only understand what is happening in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah by understanding the Israeli government's goal of creating permanent facts on the ground through the demographic transformation of East Jerusalem and the inevitable subjugation of the protected people, the Palestinians, under occupation. The third and final area of, of international law that I want to briefly mention is international human rights law. Although Israel denies that international human rights law applies to East Jerusalem and the rest of the occupied Palestinian territory, its applicability has been confirmed by the International Court of Justice in 2004. This means that the internationally recognized right to adequate housing applies in full to East Jerusalem. Among other instruments, the right to housing is found in both of the two 19, uh, 1966 international conventions on human rights. Forced evictions violate this human right. According to a former special rapporteur on the right to housing, she says, forced evictions intensify inequality, social conflict, segregation, and ghettoization, and invariably affect the poorest, most socially and economically vulnerable and marginalized sectors of society, especially women, children, minorities, and indigenous peoples. This is an entirely apt description of what is happening throughout the occupied Palestinian territory, and in particular, respecting the current evictions in East Jerusalem. According to international human rights law, evictions can only occur in the most exceptional of circumstances and cannot be undertaken in a discriminatory fashion. Yet, this is the reality in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah. So in conclusion, let me say this. Some of you listening to this panel today may say, this discussion on, on human and humanitarian rights under international law is all too abstract because Israel defies the law as few nations dare and suffers virtually no political cost in doing so. I understand the skepticism, but my reply is this. Human rights is the one common language that we have all created and that we all share. It is both our moral compass and our mirror to hold up to ourselves and to others to judge our conduct and our compliance. Yes, military and political power in the modern world is important. But popular knowledge of our fundamental rights is also an important power as well. Knowing our rights and insisting upon their recognition and their fulfillment is an irresistible tide that is the best weapon against the abuse of power. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor Ling, for uh, this very important presentation about the role of international law, international human rights law, international humanitarian law in annex Jerusalem, uh, and what it perceives of Israeli occupation and Israeli occupation policies, whether in Sheikh Jarrah uh, or in Silwan. Uh, as my colleague Asil al Baji said, anyone who wishes to ask a question or to comment can ask either in the chat or can raise her or his hand, and we will open her or his mic. So if no one has any question, I can, I can conclude. Okay, so we, we've had very important presentation. Um, sorry, uh, Budur, not to interrupt, but there's uh, someone raising his hand. Uh, Nabil, you can, uh, you can, the floor is yours. Okay, I don't know if you can see, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, it looks like my video is blocked, but that's okay. Uh, question that I had, the, the, what I want to say is not necessarily just a question, maybe even a statement. I had a conversation here with a congressman in the United States, Congressman Peters, a few years ago, uh, way back when uh, the um, Awakbe family was evicted from Sheikh Jarrah, went to his office and asked a very simple question. I said, if, if the law applies, and let's just say hypothetically speaking, of course, because we know it's false, 
if the law is true that they're giving the land back to Israelis or Jews that have prop owner, you know, uh, deeds or whatever you want to call them to the uh, to the homes, why doesn't the law apply to the Palestinians that have land taken away from them or homes taken away from them in 1948 and in 1967? In other words, you had 700,000 Palestinians were evicted from Palestine with legal documents. Why can't, I mean, like I said, again, as a statement or a question is stupid. If the law applies to the Jews, why doesn't it apply to the Palestinians? What, has anyone ever asked that question in Israeli courts? Um, if Zakaria wants to answer this question, since he's one uh, who has accompanied Palestinian families, obviously this is a question that always Palestinians have asked, thank you for your question, is the difference in the application of the law between Palestinians and between Israeli Jews which is in legal terms have one, one name, which is apartheid. Uh, so Zakaria, I, I know that yes, you yes. have raised this question uh, a lot. Yeah, this is, this is part of the Israeli discrimination laws. Yeah, in many ways, there are many laws that uh, can give right to the Jewish Israelis, but it doesn't give right to the Arab Palestinians. You know, according to them, they claim that all this property that people when they were forced to leave in 1948 as a result of the Nakba, it's now considered as part of the property of what is called Israeli Land Authority. It's a governmental body which has been, has been controlling all the property with their land or housing that were uh, been, was used by the Palestinian who forced to leave in uh, during the Nakba. In fact, it's one of the cases we have been, we were following or we followed, uh, which is Lifta, because there was a, an idea by the Israelis to sell the land of Lifta, the part in 1948, to the private sector to demolish the old houses and to build a new villas and malls and uh, shopping centers and hotels. So uh, during the legal proceeding at the central court, they said that this was raised out, they said, okay, but these people are living here, living in Jerusalem, and these are their homes and their land. So how come that they can't really have it or they can't use it? They said, no, this land is confiscated from the, uh, even before, a yani, long time before 1967, and it is belonged to the Israeli land authority. So all the land within the Palestine, the green line, Palestine, al Jadir, is considered as uh, ownership of the Israeli Land Authority. This is part. This is part of the discrimination, you know, because a lot of the families, or most of them, they have land. Uh, As Sabah, he has two buildings in Yaffa. Uh, Al Kord, they, they came from Haifa. They have a house and they had a restaurant there. So all of them, they have like property in uh, Palestine 48, but they were denied. This is part of the, that's why when we talk, we talk about it is a colonial settler apartheid regime. Thank you, Zakaria, a very comprehensive answer. And we have received an additional question regarding the role of the United Nations uh, Refugee and Work Agency, UNRWA, and whether it has supported the residents of Sheikh Jarrah. And I think Mohammed can answer this question. Mohammed, are you with us? Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, yeah, to put it briefly, the Anirwa has not done enough to help us. Um, nobody has, to be completely frank with you. Um, we've heard, again, statements and condemnations, um, but we'd like to see more than that because um, as the person in the question mentioned, the Anirwa, alongside the Jordan government, have built these housing units for us as a refugee camp really because you have gathered 28 refugee families and put them in this housing project it is um it is your responsibility to protect them um particularly after having you know withdrawn our refugee status cards from us in exchange for these um homes which they haven't really you know uh, crystallized us in so no they i don't think the anirwa has done enough i would like to see the anirwa do more i would love to see some anirwa flags in Sheikh Jarrah. i would like to see some um, some tents. I would like to see, you know, come, come, come on May 2nd, please come sit with us. It's going to be a lonely night if they evict us by ourselves. So please come. We'll, we'll be happy to um, take you on as guests. 
So yeah, to answer the question shortly, no, we have not seen enough. Uh, we have uh, another person who raised their hand, I think. If we can unmute. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, Anne from a fr French uh, Solidarity Movement, IFPS. Please excuse my English. Uh, no as I asked to Zeal and to the Korea, um, I think it would be very important every all solidarity movement everywhere mobilize uh, for uh, Sheikh Jarrah and uh, Silwan and also East Jerusalem. So it's a good opportunity. We are all together to think about it and really to make great action from uh, uh, civil society and all the solidarity movement to make know what is going on in East Jerusalem. What do you think of it? And can you, when, what can we do all together? Thank you. Okay, Asil, so probably you can answer this question regarding what solidarity movements across the globe, uh, especially those who can't come now to Palestine, can do in order to support the struggle of the Palestinian people in Sheikh Jarrah. Of course, uh, and since Mohammed talked about the importance uh, from their perspective of the people of Sheikh Jarrah for existence on the ground uh, with, uh, with them uh, on the date of the eviction on uh, May 2nd, but also they, they are mobilizing on social media under the hashtag Safe Sheikh Jarrah. And if you follow this hashtag, you will see the various um, advocacy efforts the people of Sheikh Jarrah are trying to do. Uh, we have um, in the chat box here, two of our colleagues uh, from Just Peace Advocates just shared a petition to be sent to Kani in Canada, but also I will share the two petitions in the chat box now. Uh, these can also help uh, with the efforts to stop the forced evictions in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, but also I would like to highlight that since the, the, the violations that are happening in, uh, in Sheikh Jarrah, constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, it is uh, the responsibility of all states under international law to cooperate to bring an end uh, these these violations. And uh, what can be done basically by the people is to push uh, our gov their government uh, through various means to, to, to implement the, their violations under international law to cooperate to bring in and these violations. This can be done, for example, by first recognizing that these, these uh, violations that are happening are impeding the Palestinian people from uh, practicing and exercising the right to self-determination, uh, but also in, in uh, as Mohammed highlighted, they need effective and immediate uh, action uh, to, stop, uh, to stop the evictions. This can be done by sanctions, this can then be by uh, uh, stop the trade with the settlement enterprise in the occupied territory. So uh, this is the responsibility uh, at the end of, uh, of various, uh, this can be done by various uh, parties, including people from the ground to push on their government to implement their obligations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Asil. We have uh, probably our final question for the session to Professor uh, Michael Link. Uh, whether do you think that the indictment before the ICC and the recognition that the ICC does have uh, jurisdiction over uh, crimes allegedly committed in the Palestine in the territories occupied in 1967, do you think this has any ramifications for the cases in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan? Whether or not the, uh, it'll have an, an impact upon Sheikh Jarrah uh, and Silwan is, um, is probably doubtful. Um, is, this is a long-term process in terms of the uh, investigations that are ongoing at the uh, International Criminal Court in The Hague. Keep this in mind, it took more than five years for the first stage of these complaints, the, in, the informal examination to occur. The, the second stage, the formal investigations, uh, will probably take another three, four years, I'm afraid, um, uh, in order to be able to complete it. And then the prosecutor will have to determine whether to go to the third stage, which is the actual trial. But, but the, the good thing about all this is that, in particular, Israel is taking uh, this announcement of a formal investigation very seriously. Of course, it is not cooperating. 
uh, with the ICC. Of course, uh, it is using uh, all of its diplomatic firepower to be able to denounce the court uh, and denounce these proceedings um, and is urging a number of its allies not to cooperate. But, um, but all of that to me is a sign that it recognizes both the political and the legal aspects or the consequences of, of, uh, of this investigation and these allegations that there were war crimes committed um, quite possibly in Gaza and through the settlements and through annexation and through uh, such uh, aspects as, uh, uh, as forced evictions, uh, all of which are uh, illegal under international law and most of which come under the definition of war crimes or crimes of aggression under the Rome Statute. So, um, so again, as I said at the end of my talk, it's important to be skeptical with respect to the law's possibilities, but it's never permissible, I think, to be cynical about what uh, the law can achieve if there is um, uh, civil action to want to try to enforce uh, laws, particularly uh, laws regarding the war crimes. This is the best possible legal and political form right now with respect to international accountability for an occupation that has paid very little cost over the past five plus decades uh, for its uh, violations of international law. And we should all be trying to find ways of supporting uh, this investigation. Thank you, Professor Lane. And of course, before I, um, before I finish, I will, uh, I will first thank all of those who attended this uh, talk, this webinar, uh, all the attendees, all the speakers. Uh, of course, we've had so many important uh, statements, important presentations. We've had Professor Ling's statement and presentation about the role of international law, Asil and the Zakaria's presentations as well. But I will leave the floor for Hamad to give a final and to conclude this webinar because I think it is his right and it is the right of the people of Sheikh Jarrah to be heard and to be listened to because it is their struggle. And we are all here, not only with solidarity, but with, to support them. So I will allow Mohammed to end this presentation and thank you again for your uh, attendance, Mohammed. Thank you so much, Badur. I really, really appreciate you and um, all your effort and I appreciate everybody listening. I just wanna conclude with one um, recommendation. Um, the, word, the word eviction does not capture the heft of what is going on whatsoever. When we think of eviction, although I believe eviction is bad regardless of who it's happening to, especially I'm here in New York City right now and gentrification eviction is an imminent threat for a lot of uh, marginalized communities here in New York, but eviction does not capture um, doors being blown up, children being thrown from windows, um, the entire city being on lockdown by the Israeli military. So it's really important for us, even when discussing these topics, to ensure that we support the Palestinian experience, the Palestinian rhetoric um, of this experience, because we don't see these as evictions. We see these as, um, quite frankly, thefts. And we don't, we don't accept or um, normalize the Israeli courts. What is, what is a district court? What, what the hell is a central court? All of them in our eyes are occupation courts. All of them are courts in which settler judges and settler juries are in fact enforcing settler rule, are in fact enforcing and paving the way um, for settlers to take over our lands and empty our, our city of its indigenous residents. So it's really important for people when dealing um, with Israeli occupation courts in Jerusalem to at least highlight um, our sentiments about these courts, which are in fact settler colonial courts, to at least shed, shed some doubt on these courts and not normalize their existence as, as okay or sovereign in, in a city that they have illegally annexed. And with that, I really just want to conclude and um, appreciate everybody for being here today. And I appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. I'm happy to have any further conversations after this webinar. And I just want to say thank you um, to Al Haq and all the all, all the co-sponsors. And I really appreciate everybody's presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, everyone.